Hey everybody, it's Matt. Welcome or welcome back to the Journey Church Podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can automatically get our weekly episodes. And you might want to go ahead and subscribe to our Journey YouTube channel as well. You'll find messages, music, interviews, inspiring stories, and more for you all right there. Now, I hope this episode helps you take your next step in following Jesus. I just want to ask you this morning to consider what steals your peace the most. I, what, what are you most afraid of? Because fear can steal your peace, can't it? Um, so let me just calm you down a little bit. We're not going to jump too serious too quickly. Let me, just, let me just ride this out for a second. If I were to ask this question, I would get a, a set of answers. If you asked me this question... You'd get a set, a set of very, uh, for my family, very obvious answers. Number one, snakes. N- top of the list. Uh, j- just so you know, anything that Indiana Jones is afraid of, I'm afraid of. Um, so sh- snakes hits that number one for me. Luckily, uh, as we'll talk about in a second, I have a, a really good uh, a warning system in my head that keeps me away from snakes. Uh, number two, sharks. Uh, that's why I don't like swimming in the ocean. I uh, went a snorkeling one time. That's it. Didn't see a shark, but knew I was going to. So I got out of the water. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's when you know something is controlling you is when you try it and you realize I'm not going to make it. So you just give up really quick. Uh, the third thing I think, uh, and honestly, I know you're going th- to gonna think this is hilarious because it is. Uh, sorry, a tornado, a sharknado with sharks in it. A tornado with sharks in it. T- number three, right? <laughs> No, but think about, think about what you're most afraid of. And you often talk about these things that are momentary fears, right? So when you think about it, let me go to that next slide. Fear is a helpful warning signal for us, isn't it? Like fear has kept you from doing some really, really stupid things as a teenager. Teenagers in the room, fear is there for a reason, Right? It kept me safe in times. Fear is a very helpful thing that God pre-wired into our brains to warn us, don't do that, you could get hurt. That's what fear is for. And you guys know this from maybe your psychology classes or your biology classes. What are the three ways that we handle fear in the moment? Do you guys remember what they are? The three, you remember, here, I'll help you out with it. Remember, fight, flight, or freeze. Right? Those are the three ways our brain is wired to respond to fear. So when you're in a moment, let's say you meet a snake, some of you are fighters, and you're like, oh, me, no. I am a flight. I have learned from an early age that at my size and ability, running is always a better answer than fighting. So fight, my brain never, ever says, you should fight. I'm always like, you should run. Every fear I have is about running. Now, some of you are fighters, and I get that. You, you, when you get afraid, you bow up. I don't even know how, but you just, ah, you suddenly get ready to fight, and you scare people because you're scared, right? Those of us who run, pretty obvious, runners are easy to spot. You freeze people I still don't get. Like, you got no response. Like, what? But that's the way, listen. That's the way our brains are wired to respond to things in the moment. And here's the thing. It's just not very helpful in certain situations. That's why we've been talking about in this series, you're not the boss of me. We've been trying to figure out, we've talked about all these different emotions. We've talked about guilt. We've talked about anger. We're talking about fear today. How can you keep fear from being your boss? Because there's a lot of times your fears are not helpful. It's a warning signal But sometimes that fear is warning you off something is actually really, really good for you. And you're responding to fight, flight, or freeze to something that is not really something you should fight or flee or freeze in the middle of. And so you, in this moment, your brain is telling you this is fear. And yet, in those moments... To address your fear and do something about it is actually the wisest thing and the best thing in the long run to do in some of those situations. So so let me just walk you through. If I were asking the question, what's your greatest fear or what you're most afraid of, it really wouldn't be those things like uh, snakes and sharks and whatever, spiders for some of you or the dark or whatever it is for you. It really wouldn't be those things. So can I I walk you through the, the fact that sometimes we don't think about our fears enough? And you're like, why would I want to think about what I'm afraid of? Here's why you want, because 
we don't think about really what the core fear that is drives us because our brain is so good at asking one little question that causes our fears to take control of us. It's called this question, what if? And what if is a great question, right? But what do you do when what if is on repeat? And you can't get out of the mode of asking what if and 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 what if. And you never act because you're frozen or you run away from something that you shouldn't run away from that you stand and fight because you're so scared, or you start fighting something you shouldn't be fighting because that's your first response. But instead, what if you stopped and asked, why am I stuck in this what-if cycle? What, what, would you, what would it cause you to do? Let me, let me give you some clues where I'm taking you this morning because I want you to be thinking through. There's actually, I think, some very simple things you can do to help identify really what it is you're afraid of in those moments. Now, obviously, there's some immediate fears you should fight, fly, or freeze (laughs) in the midst of. But there's other things I want you to be aware of that there's a deeper core fear that's driving you. And it's taking control of you. And nobody wants to be controlled by their fear. So let me, if you're this person, what if you ask this question? At the core, you may be asking, what if life gets harder if this happens? Like, if you really dive into it, a lot of our decisions about, like, our, our relationships when they start seeming stale? We ask this question because it, we, we don't really want life to get harder. And if I have to continue in this relationship and working on it, my life's going to get harder to make this relationship work. So it'd be better just to fight it out, flee away from it, or just not do anything and just let it go. Right? Or maybe in your personal growth. Right? What if you're seeing something you need to grow in at work or professionally? Or maybe it's just in your character. You're like, man, I really need to work on being more generous. Or, man, I really need to work on this. Or, man, work on. And yet, in the midst of it, you're going, yeah, but what if, what if it makes my life harder in the meantime? And you know what you're really asking? You know what you're really afraid of? You're afraid of losing your security in life. You're afraid you're going to lose the thing that makes you feel secure. And so rather than risk that, really all the what-ifs you've lined up are really about one what-if is what if my life gets harder because you don't want to lose your security. That's that's one fear. I think it's a central part of of kind of the questions asked. What about this question? Some of us get down, if you really looked at the what-ifs you're asking, it came down to what if I'm not happy anymore? And this may be in relationships as well. Like you start looking at the relationship you're in and you're like, what if 10 years around the road I'm not happy anymore? Or or you start looking at your workplace and you're like, man, this is just is not making me happy like it did once before. Or maybe there's some other decisions you're looking at and really at the core of this is just, I don't know if I could be happy. In other words, I would put this as satisfaction. You're afraid that your satisfaction with your own life is going to stop and so you what if and what if and what if and what if. But at the core is your satisfaction and that's the real question you have. That's the real fear. You're afraid of losing that. And then for some of us, it's this. You're asking, what if I can't make a difference? And this is why, hey, listen, this is why many of you in the room are uncertain about serving in the community or serving here in our church because you don't want to get into something and be like giving time away to something because you're not sure you have what it takes to do what it is. You see that there's a gap in doing and you're not willing to do it. Or maybe it's in, in your generosity and giving money. You're not sure, well, I don't know if my money really make a difference. Or maybe it's just in something very simple with your neighbors because you're like, I just don't. Maybe it's at your workplace where there's a really, a really good project you could dive into a little bit extra time, a little bit extra effort, but you're not sure will it even make a difference in what everybody's doing around in the office. And, and you just don't do anything because it's really about your significance. You're afraid that if you take this risk, you'll lose what you have in significance because you're risking your significance by doing that. So here's what I want to help you understand this morning. We don't need to be controlled by these fears of things. Jesus didn't want us to be controlled by these fear of things. In fact, Jesus spent a lot of his time with his own disciples trying to help them understand what their fears were like and what they should do when the what ifs and the what ifs and what ifs just built up on them. He actually gave them a pretty clear way to make it through their fears that were keeping them from doing the most important things. Because here's what I know about many of you in the room. There's something you're afraid of doing or addressing or taking care of this week because it may steal your security. It may steal your satisfaction. It may steal your significance. And you're afraid that on the other side of this conversation or this choice or whatever it is you're facing, it's just too much to handle. I'm too afraid to go forward, so I will 
fight it out. I'll just flee away from it or I'll just freeze in the midst of it and see what happens. And that is how fear becomes your boss. And Jesus doesn't want that. So let me walk you through. I'm gonna, I, have a, I have a couple of stories to share with you from um, um, the book of Matthew written by one of Jesus' best friends. And what I find so unique about these two stories is the unique language that links them together, whereas Jesus is teaching his disciples really one principle that I want to help you grab onto. And listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus here this morning, let this be maybe uh, just a, an idea of why we as Christians think about faith the way we do, why we, why we strive to work on these things in face of our fears. And you've watched some Christians in your life who have faced some really scary things with peace. And you've watched them face it with confidence and courage, even though there was nothing solid to stand on. And you've watched them make decisions that look like it was going to make their life harder. But in the long run, you watched and watched and watched. And you thought, man, that was really, really hard. And they did it anyway. Man, and it made a difference. So here's what I'm walking through. I want to I catch you up where we're going to start in the first story in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus um, is kind of beginning of his ministry and his disciples are pretty new to following him and they don't know him really well. And I think Jesus is kind of starting to set the tone for what he wants his followers to be thinking about and how they, he wants them to be thinking about their own lives and, and everything around them. And it says that Jesus had done some healing and kind of a crowd started to gather and Jesus is like, hey, we need to, we need to get away Let's, hey, let's all get in a boat and let's go out on the Sea of Galilee. Let's go out there and let's, let's just take some time with just us in the boat. And I'm sure everybody's like, yes, a retreat, a little bit of calm. And then this happens. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake. So the waves swept over the boat. I don't know about you. I'm not, a, again, sharks don't get in boats much. Not even in the lake. I know there's no sharks in the lake, so they say. But water coming over a boat, I don't care who you are. These, some of these guys were experienced fishermen. And the reason they were in this situation is because Jesus asked them out there. They thought it was being calm. And the storm brings something they did not expect. Water's coming over the boat. You do the math. Water in a boat doesn't float. I just made that up just now. Rhymed it out. Made it. But here's, here's an interesting part. Water's coming over the boat, right? And here's the next line. But Jesus was sleeping. First waterbed in history. <laughs> right? I, don't, I can go to sleep on a boat, no big deal. Water coming over, this is not a houseboat. This is an open, open-faced boat. Right, he's laying, I don't know, maybe he's propped up on the end of the boat and he's sleeping and water's hitting his feet and he's just like in dream world and you know, and you have those dreams. And may, I don't know the situation, but I find it very, very interesting that in this situation, Jesus is just like, I'm not even acknowledging what's going on here. I'm not, I'm not even concerned. I'm fully asleep. You can, and you guys have heard the story before, but you can guess how the disciples or what they're doing in this middle of the situation, Let's re- here's where they're at. Jesus is sleeping, and the disciples went and woke him up. Like, why would you have to wake somebody up when the boat's going underwater? Saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And here's what's so cool about this, guys. They go to the right person, right? In the midst of this storm, who would you call on? You call on Jesus. They do the right thing. They know who to go to. They know who to go for help. So why does Jesus respond the way he responds if they did the right thing? I don't know if you thought about it this way. They're scared to death. And here's what Jesus says to them when he wakes up. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? But Jesus, they did the right thing. They went to you when they were in trouble. And now listen, Jesus isn't a dummy. I I don't think he was asking this question to make him, what's your problem? I mean, he was asleep. But what was he trying to do with this question? Why, Why are you so afraid? Of course he knows why they're afraid. They're afraid because water inside boats don't mix. Wind and boats being crashed around don't mix. There's something to be, there's a real fear here. There's a reality. 
There's a reality that Jesus, it's not like Jesus is like, what do you, what's your problem? There's nothing to be afraid of. He didn't say there's nothing to be afraid of. He says, why are you so afraid? In other words, why is your fear the thing that's controlling your reactions right now? I think it's because he was trying to point them to something else. And because this is what he does next. He asks this question and he doesn't wait for their answer. He says this, and then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves And it was completely calm. And then the men were amazed, no kidding, and asked, what kind of man is this? And this is what I love about this story. Who are you more afraid of? The wind and the waves? Or the guy who just told it all to calm down? Does Jesus want his disciples to be afraid of his power? Is that why he did this? Is why he set this, did he set this whole thing up? I don't know. But let me just, let me just posit a, a situation. If you wanted your disciples to know that they didn't have to be afraid, how would you teach them that? Do you tell them, hey, don't be afraid? No, no, no. You ever told your kids that? Hey, there's nothing to be afraid of. Why are you afraid of the dark? Have you told them that before? Doesn't work, does it? No. You can tell me all day long. (laughs) Dude, do you know that the the number of shark attacks in the world is less than the number of car accidents? And you drive in a car every day. I'm not getting in the ocean every day. Not going to do it. You're never going to convince me to go snorkeling again. Never in my life. Jellyfish are also in the ocean. This is not about teaching us and telling us not to be afraid. This is Jesus showing them something different. Can I show you another story that just happens a few chapters later in Matthew? You don't get a choice. I'm going to show it to you anyway. Matthew chapter 14. In the the midst of this, Jesus goes on with his day. They they come out of this uh, this experience, and obviously they've learned something. And Jesus starts healing people, and he goes to different towns, and he preaches, and he's doing all this stuff. And they come to this time when 5,000 people have gathered to to get healed and to hear Jesus teach. And Jesus looks at one of the disciples and he says, hey, um, you need to get some food. These people are getting hungry. And the disciples all look at Jesus and be like, "Um, it would take a year's wages to feed all these people. And where would you expect us to get all that food? And Jesus goes, listen, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Calm down. Just start passing it out. I don't know about you. Doesn't sound like a reasonable request. They do it. Right? And lo and behold, everybody starts eating and they get done and they start collecting the leftovers. There's 12 baskets full. And right at the end of the story, they start collecting the baskets. And just before the disciples can do their victory dance of like, look what we did, right? It says this Jesus said, immediately, immediately, they start collecting the baskets, 12 baskets full, immediately. Jesus made them get into a boat. Jesus, I ain't getting in that boat. This is funny, right? He made them get in the boat. I don't know how he made them get in the boat, but I know they were like, Jesus, no. I know I would be like that. No, 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 no. Jesus, I learned my lesson. We just don't need to get in boats with you. We don't need to go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Jesus somehow could, I don't know if he, I don't know if he bribed them. I don't know if he told them, you get in this boat or I will make your hair fall out. I don't know what he said. That's a bad one for me. I don't want my hair to fall out. Those of you who have hair falling out, I'm so sorry, right? But here's the deal. Immediately they get in the boat and they're out on the water. Jesus doesn't get in the boat with them this time. It says that Jesus makes them get in the boat. They go out on the water and Jesus goes to a mountainside to pray. This is pretty cool, right? And then Jesus, he, they're out there in the boat and he comes walking out on the water to them and all this, the, the storm has come up. And Jesus is walking across these stormy waters. And they're, they've been rowing and they're trying to fight the storm. And they're in the middle of a storm all by themselves. And they look out and they go, it's a ghost. Man, fear will make you say some dumb things, right? And in the midst of this new situation, same fears are going crazy. Jesus goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. That's a, Jesus We're in the middle of the same situation and you weren't with us this time. This is what's interesting. 
So Jesus has added some new fears to the situation. It's not the same old, same old. You're in this boat by yourself now. Teaches them a new part of this lesson. He's walking out to them. And this is what's interesting about the next response from Peter. Poor Peter says, Lord, if it's you, I know what you can do. I've seen you calm a storm just by talking to it. And I've seen you feed people with five loaves and two fish. And I don't know how to happen. So if it's you, and this is a huge moment for Peter, right? If it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the water. Think about that for a second. You're in fear of the storm you're in, in the boat. You see somebody walk in the water, you think it's a ghost. Fear, fear, fear. And Peter stands up and goes, if it's you, then tell me to walk out there. This is the moment, right? You've heard, if you've heard the story before, like this is one of those moments. And he gets out there, right? But here's what happens. He gets out there. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. I wonder if Peter thought, maybe if I'll show Jesus I'm willing to get out of the boat, then everything will calm down. Maybe, maybe once I take this big leap out into the stormy waters, it's going to just calm down like last time because he's here. And once I get to him, it'll get calm. Once I get out there and grab onto Jesus, where Jesus is, it's calm. Maybe if I get out there, it's just going, everything's just going to go great. And he gets out there and it's like, oh crud, it's actually wind. There's waves. Oh my goodness, I'm walking. Now Jesus, save me. Isn't that a good thing to say? Isn't that a good thing to do? Yeah, I'm not telling you it's bad not to reach out to God. But listen, in those moments, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples something else. And here's, here's what he does next. Jesus, it says, Jesus immediately reached his hand out and caught him. You of little faith. Again, same phrase, right? Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? It's not that Peter doubted Jesus' power necessarily. I think Jesus is trying to point us all and his disciples to something different. Because see, those of us who follow Jesus, we know Jesus has the power. We just think he's going to use his power differently than he often does. And instead of trusting the power he has to do what we can't see, we stop believing in his power and stop focusing on the circumstances that are around us. So Jesus grabs his hand. You little faith, why did you doubt? And it says this, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then what did the disciples do again? Same exact response. Truly, you are the son of God. And this is what I think. With your fears, with my fears, I think the problem is that they control us because we are unwilling to release the control of our fears to the one who has control of the storm. And what we'd rather have is just calm in the storm. We can have that, but we think it's going to look differently than the way Jesus has it planned out because Jesus is trying to teach us something different about himself and about you in the midst of something that you're afraid of. And here's what he wants to teach them. Let me wrap up these two stories with, I think, one basic principle that can free you from the power of fear, and it's this. He wants their confidence in his power to overwhelm their fear. It's not that there's nothing to be afraid of, guys. There's lots of things to be afraid of in this life. Well, what if this happens while we're on this trip? Or, or what if I take this job and this ends up? And, and what if I stay in this job and then this happens? And what if I do this and she does that? And what if I say this and he does that? And, and what if I do this? And it'd be better if I just didn't do anything at all. It'd be better if I just, maybe I just stick it out and I fight them all for it. Maybe i just better if I just run away from it all and get away. No, no, no. Jesus says, no, no. I want you to have more confidence in me than the fear you're facing. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to make everything better immediately all the time. But I'm going to stand here with you and help you do what needs to be done. Because my power, <laughs> listen, if you had to choose between the storm 
and the guy who can calm the storm, which one are you have more confidence in? And Jesus, over and over again, tries to tell his disciples, have more confidence in me. And this is what's so interesting. He teaches this over and over and over again, and his disciples just never get it. This is why I trust the Gospels. Because over and over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over again, the disciples look scared. They don't get it. They can't quite figure Jesus out the whole time they're with him. They can't figure it out. This is why over and over again, he sends them out to do things, and he's like, no, 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 not that way. No, 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 you got to love these people too. No, 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 guys, you're not getting it. I have the power to feed these people. He fed another group of people, and they, they still ask questions. They had already fed 5,000, and then 4,000 show up, and they still don't think he can do it. They're still confused. They just don't understand, right? And why, if you were trying to start a new religion, why would you write all these stories down about your leaders being dumb? It just doesn't make sense to me. So when I look at these stories, I trust the Gospels because it makes the disciples look really, really scared all the time. And when Jesus was arrested, Peter has this one moment where he thinks he's being brave. But let's all be honest. There's a moment in the garden. The Roman soldiers come to take Jesus. Judas comes up and kisses Jesus on both cheeks as a sign of this is the guy you need to arrest. And Peter's like, I'll pull my sword and I'll protect you. And he goes and he swings and he slices and he's such a good man with a sword. He cuts off a guy's ear. Ooh, good job, Peter. Right? Fear was driving Peter. Not confidence in Jesus' power. Just a few weeks before this, Peter had said, I won't let anybody take you. And Jesus had looked at Peter already and said, get behind me, Satan, because I'm going to get taken. Peter had no confidence. Who was there to support Jesus and defend his name in front of the Sanhedrin? Nobody. What was Peter doing? I don't know him. I don't know him at all. No confidence. Where did all the disciples go when Jesus was crucified and after he was brought down? Did anybody help bring his body down? Nope. They ran. They hid. Where were they? Were they, were they planning what they should do and, and how they should go about being the people now that Jesus got? Did they do it? No. They didn't do anything. They were so afraid. They had lost all their security. Jesus had taught them that they could depend on him, but now he was gone. They had nothing. And they'd, they'd lost all happiness. Can you imagine the joy they had with Jesus every single day, even though they didn't have a lot of wealth? Jesus had nothing. He didn't have a home. He didn't have a bed to lay his head down in. But he was so much joy everywhere he went. Children and people and women and poor, they loved being around him. Can you imagine going with Jesus everywhere, how much fun it was? But they had lost all that. And gosh, what significance did they have? They had no purpose. They had nothing. What would, what would they do without him? And this is why. Once they see Jesus alive, the stories in the Gospels change from scared little guys to confident, at peace, willing to stand men. They're willing to stand in front of the Jewish leaders and preach and teach and tell them, no, we're not going to stop telling about this Jesus we knew and we saw him alive. And now they had confidence. <laughs> and this is why they were willing to be stoned and beaten and flogged and still sing praises of him inside of prisons. And this is why they were willing to go out into different communities and collect money that they didn't have from all their people and give it away to other people to help them because they had confidence in something that was more powerful than their fear. They had seen a man conquer death. And this is why Peter, that guy who tried to get out on the water and didn't understand it then, that guy who tried to slice with a sword and cut off a guy's ear and just scared to death everything was going to fall apart, and it did exactly the way he thought it would. This is why years later he writes to a group of churches and he says this one phrase, cast all your fears on him because he cares for you. This is his confidence, guys. Yes, there's something to be afraid of. But you can cast your fears on him because he cares for you. And that's the difference. When fear is in control, 
You're not thinking about the care that God has for you in the midst of your circumstances. You can only think about, am I going to be secure? Am I going to have satisfaction? And will I have significance in this? That's all you can think about. That's why you ask the what if questions you do, because one of those things you're going to lose. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm giving you all that. I can give you security. I can give you joy in the midst of pain. That health problem that you're dealing with, yes, you should be scared. It's scary. But I'm with you. And I can give you happiness in the midst of this. I can give you joy in the midst of this. Yeah, but my marriage, it just feels dead. (laughs) Yeah, but I can give you security in the midst of that. I can help you learn how to love and be patient and be kind in the midst of that. Yeah, but my job, it just feels like I'm doing the same thing over and over again. And I don't think I'm really making a difference. It's okay. I can help you. I can do this in the midst of this. I know you're scared to do this thing, but I'm with you. Will your confidence in him be more powerful than the fear you have standing in front of you? And so, how do you do that? Simple. So simple. You trade your fears for his love. That's it. And you're like, oh, yeah, thanks, Jared. Trade your fear for snakes. Okay, I'm working on it, all right? But those core fears, how do you do that? Here's my challenge for you. Super practical, something you can do today. Or as you feel those fears rise up, right? You think you've got it beat, and then, man, tonight you lay down, and, man, everything comes back. What if, what if, what if? And you're what if in yourself right into a, just a swirl of fears, right? Here's what you do. You've got to sit down, and you've got to write down all the things that you're afraid of. You've got to write down your fears. Why? Because if you don't write them all out, They just become what if, what if, what if questions and they become part of you. And when you write them down and you write them out on a piece of paper or you type them out on a note, they become something else besides you. And then number two, you look at those fears and you decide, what is the core fear behind each of these fears? Right? What is that core fear? Is it a security fear? Is it a satisfaction fear? Is it a significance fear? Is this about me feeling secure? Is this about me feeling important? Is this about me feeling happy? Which of those core fears is it? And if you can identify the core fear, then you know what you can do? You can go, God, I think think I'm more afraid of being important than I am confident that you're going to give me the significance I need if I'll do what you ask me to do. God, I, I think I'm actually more concerned about my happiness than I am about doing the thing that's right in this situation. And even though this is harder than doing it this easy way, God, I realize that trusting you is more important than me just thinking I can be happy over here fly, fleeing away from this, this situation. God, I, maybe it's just about my, my security in life. I, I won't feel secure, but God, you're telling me that I can trust you and be secure in that? And this, uh, yes. So you just actually have to trade those core fears for something that's more powerful. Because remember, guys, I don't know about you, but if you're standing in the middle of a storm and a guy says, hey, why don't y'all calm down and everything goes quiet, I think you can trust that kind of guy. And I think you can trust the guy who went to the cross, died a real death, faced a death, and then came back from it under his own power. You can trust a guy like that because if he can conquer death... He can conquer your fear. But I'll bet, I'll bet, even if you make it to this far, this is step two. Number three is the real thing because that fear is going to keep popping up. You need to make a list of truths about God so that you can fight your fear with the actual truth of who he is. Because this is not about him fixing your circumstances. This is about him being the power that you need in the midst of it. So you make a list, and listen, if you need a list of verses, there's this cool thing. I don't know if you heard about it, but you can go to the Internet, and there's this thing called Google. Maybe you're a Bing person. I don't know. But you can type in, I'm afraid of blank. Tell me a verse that helps me not be afraid of blank. Did you know you can find verses that way? It will give you, there are people who put these lists together. If you're anxious about this, if you're worried about this, if you're afraid of this, it gives you verses to read. And you know what you've got to do? You've got to trade those truths for your fears. You write out your fears. You identify the core of it. And then you trade the truth about who God is because this is not about him fixing anything for you. This is about you being more confident in who he is than the fear that you're facing. And I hope 
this week, rather than fleeing away from something, you'll stand. And rather than standing with your fists up and fighting, you'll stand to do what's right for the people around you. And rather than freezing up, you'd be willing to do the thing, say the thing, or be the person. Because you're confident in who Jesus is and the power that he has, rather than looking at the storm that's swirling around you. Let me pray for you. God, I pray. God, we all have fears we're facing. We all have decisions to make. We all have people in our lives that we're afraid to approach or talk to. We have things at work that we're afraid to address. God, whatever it is that we're afraid of this week, would you give us confidence that your power is greater than our fear? And if we will be obedient to what you've asked us to do in the middle of it, that God, it is better in the long run, even if it looks like right now that we're gonna lose something in the midst. God, you lost everything. Jesus gave his life to show us that there is life beyond that death. God, thank you for the gift that you give us through Jesus' death and resurrection that is available to us even in these small fears or these big fears. And God, especially as you approach this holiday season, God, would you help us have peace In the moments when we feel like fear has control of us, God, we want you to be our boss, not our fear. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you'd like more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our Journey app to access all of our recent message content. And our app is the easiest way to share this content with a friend. For more information on our church or to find our app or our YouTube channel, just visit journeycalway.com. That's journeycalway.com. Thanks for listening.